Throughout its existence, the Yugoslovenska Narodna Armija strove to develop domestic tank designs in order to break its dependence on foreign suppliers. The initial projects involved either reusing already available components or simply improving an available design. None of these ever advanced beyond the prototype stage. The first successful locally produced tank, although a licensed copy, was the M84, which entered service in the second half of the 1980s. Despite being a competent design, the Yugoslavian military high command wanted an even better performing tank, which would lead to the Vihor project. Following the end of the Second World War, the JNA entered a short period of close cooperation with the Soviet Union. This cooperation is reflected in the procurement of large quantities of military equipment, including tanks, such as the T-34-85. While the JNA was still in its early development phase, political tensions between Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union ultimately led to the so-called Tito-Stalin split in 1948, which basically isolated Yugoslavia from the Eastern Bloc. The JNA at this point was in a quite precarious situation. The army was in the process of reorganization and rearmament and was heavily dependent on Soviet military supplies. One way to resolve the dependence on foreign aid was to introduce domestic tank production. This was, at that time, a daunting task for the war-devastated Yugoslavian industry. Nevertheless, in 1948, work on such vehicles was initiated. This led to the creation of a small series of five prototype vehicles, known simply as Vozilo A. The various construction problems with these prototypes would ultimately doom the project. While Vehicle A was canceled, in the years that followed, the JNA would conduct a series of different projects aimed at either developing a new vehicle by using existing components from available tanks, or improving the performance of those vehicles that were already in service. Nothing came of these, given the inability of the Yugoslav industry to produce tanks or develop new major components. In 1978, a major breakthrough was made when the JNA finally managed to purchase a license for the production of the T-72 main battle tank. The first prototype was finished in 1979. As the first T-72 tanks began to be produced, the JNA military hierarchy wanted to go further by developing a new, improved design. While it was heavily based on and similar to the T-72, the new project was to incorporate a series of domestically produced parts and components, such as electronic components, optical devices, and an improved engine, to name a few. This would lead to the creation of the first successful domestic tank project named M84, of which some 650 tanks would be built in a few different versions. When the M84 entered service, it was deemed a good design. More importantly, it fulfilled the decade-long dream of the JNA's military high command of producing a domestic tank. Still, it was theorized that even this tank would eventually become obsolete. Thus, as the M84 production was underway, the Chief Military Technical Council initiated a new tank project designated as Zadatak Vihor. The new tank was to have improved firepower, mobility, and protection to rival that of other modern tank designs in the world. To speed up the development time, the most advanced components of the existing T-72 and M-84 tanks were to be reused. In order to gain a better grasp of the new tank technologies, a JNA military delegation would be sent to a few countries around the world. In early 1985, one of the first countries visited was France and the AMX tank manufacturer. The JNA delegation was presented with newly developed AMX armor plates. The JNA officials were especially interested in the AMX engine development, and talks were initiated on the possible purchase of the V8X engines. While serious negotiations were undertaken, for unspecified reasons, this was never realized. Egypt and China were also visited. As the Egyptian tank industry was modest, not much was learned there. China was more promising, and the JNA delegation had the chance to see the Type 59, but otherwise, no deals were made. Lastly, the United Kingdom was visited in 1986. At that time, the United Kingdom's arms industry was more than willing to sell various military equipment. 
The JNA officials were not keen to purchase any technologies from the United Kingdom, as most parts would not fit or were simply too expensive to acquire. In any case, the first drawings and calculations of what would become the new tank were completed in 1985. As no major issues were found with the first drafts, the project got the green light and work on the first prototype began in 1987. The completion of the prototype stage was to be achieved by the end of 1994 or 1995 with the production of some 15 trial vehicles. If all went with no problem, a yearly production order of 100 vehicles was to be given. The production run was to begin in 1996 and end in 2012. The first pre-prototype vehicle was completed in 1989 and given to the JNA for testing. The VHOR design was to be powered by the B46 TK1 1200 horsepower engine. The power to weight ratio in this vehicle was 27.2 horsepower per ton. In comparison, the T-72 had a ratio of 18 horsepower per ton, while the Abrams had 26 horsepower per ton. The engine could effectively work at temperatures ranging from below 30 degrees Celsius to 53 degrees Celsius. With a vehicle weight of only 44 tons, the maximum speed achieved was 75 kilometers per hour, and acceleration from zero to 32 kilometers per hour required seven seconds. The engine compartment was also cleverly designed to be as small as possible, and as a result, the engine, with transmission assembly, took up only 3.4 cubic meters. This greatly aided to reduce the vehicle's overall dimensions and helped to save weight. The suspension consisted of six road wheels, a rear drive sprocket, a front idler, and three return rollers. These were suspended using torsion bar units. While more or less a copy of those on the M84, there were some differences. The VHOR's road wheel vertical travel was increased to 350 millimeters in comparison to 280 millimeters on the M84. The VHOR had an electromechanical turret traverse system, and thanks to this system, the turret's horizontal rotation speed was 20 degrees per second, so it swung 360 degrees in 18 seconds. In contrast to the generally round-shaped turret used on the M84 and T72, the VHOR received quite a different design. While the front was similar, the rear of the turret was redesigned and extended, and the extra free space was used to store the radio and other equipment. On top of the turret, there were two escape hatches for the turret crew members. The one on the left was for the gunner, and the one on the right was for the commander. For the main armament, the 125mm 2A46M smoothbore gun was chosen. Given its availability and general effectiveness, it was logical to reuse this gun for the VHOR project. The difference was that it would have received a number of improvements and modifications to further increase its effectiveness and durability. These included adding a muzzle reference system for measuring gun barrel curvature, thermal insulation lining of the barrel, using better raw materials for the production, and improved production techniques for its construction and testing a new quick change mechanism, among others. The gun was to be provided with horizontal and vertical stabilization. In order to help the crew with targeting, the VHOR was to be provided with advanced electronic ballistic computers. The VHOR fire control system was a complex unit consisting of many elements. These included a display for the commander connected to the gunner's sight, thermal imaging with a magnification of times eight to times 10, a laser range finder, third generation night vision, and a laser warning receiver connected to the externally mounted smoke launchers. The electronic ballistic computer could be used to enter all the necessary information regarding the target. The electromechanical autoloader was basically the same as the one used in the M84. This autoloader was located under the turret on the tank's floor and held 22 rounds in its rotating transporter. An additional 18 rounds were to be stored inside the crew compartment. With these and other various improvements, the rate of fire was estimated to be around 10 rounds per minute. It was requested that the gun, with all its improvements included, be capable of piercing 400 millimeters of RHA armor at ranges of 2 kilometers using armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding Sabo rounds. When using high-explosive anti-tank rounds, it was supposed to be able to penetrate around 600 millimeters of RHA armor. 
Besides the main armament, the secondary armament consisted of one coaxial 7.62mm and a turret-mounted 12.7mm heavy machine gun. The Vihor would have had increased armor protection compared to other modern Yugoslav tanks. The front hull side was angled at 71 degrees, and the new armor construction was to provide protection equivalent to 650 millimeters of homogeneous steel plate armor. Against heat rounds, it was claimed to offer 600 millimeters of protection. The flat side armor plates were much weaker, with a thickness of just 70 millimeters. The turret front armor thickness is unknown. What is known, however, is that it was angled at 40 degrees and provided the same level of protection as the hull front armor. Similar to the improved M84 versions, the Vihor also had a cast turret. In addition, its turret front had a cavity that was filled with quartz sand mixed with an adhesive. Additional protection could be acquired by adding anti-heat screens or explosive reactive armor. In the case of the explosive reactive armor, it was the domestically developed M99 type. In the best case scenario, this provided an 80% increase in protection against heat rounds. More realistically, it provided additional protection in the area of 30 to 50%. Against kinetic rounds, it offered a slight increase of protection of around 25%. The M99 ERA was immune to fire up to 23 millimeter caliber rounds, including artillery shrapnel or detonations of other ERA units. This armor added a total weight of 750 kilograms, a further 250 kilograms if the sides were also protected. The development of this armor began in the early 1990s, but it was not yet ready to be added on the prototype and was never actually fully installed on any Vihor tank. The Vihor was also meant to be equipped with the BDK smoke dischargers. These consisted of 24 discharge units divided into two groups and placed on either side of the turret. The maximum effective range of this system was 500 meters. Besides standard smoke rounds, illumination, anti-infantry, or anti-missile flares could also be used. This tank was also provided with nuclear biological chemical protection. It received an inner lining that protected the crew from neutron radiation, and a detector for biological weapons was also added. The Vihor had a crew of three, consisting of the commander, the gunner, and the driver. Their positions were unchanged in comparison to the M84 tanks. The gunner and the commander were placed in the turret while the driver was positioned in the lower hull. The single pre-prototype was equipped with an M84 turret and used for extensive drive testing. No major problems with the first design were noted. While the development of the Vihor was underway, the Yugoslav Wars broke out, and this marked the end of many military projects, including the Vihor. The first pre-prototype test vehicle was located in Serbia at the time of the war's outbreak. Due to a lack of documentation and proper equipment, it was not possible to fully finish this prototype. It would eventually be stored in an army depot. Two completed prototype hulls were located in Croatia, while the two incomplete turrets were left in Slovenia when the war started. The Croatians would use the two hulls, together with the available documentation and tooling, and start their own tank development project. This would lead to the creation of Degman and M84A 4D projects. This concludes our look at the Vihor tank. What do you think? If Yugoslavia hadn't disintegrated, would this tank have been able to compete on equal footing with the most modern designs of that time? Would you like to learn more about Yugoslavia's Cold War designs? Let us know in the comments. If you haven't already, consider becoming a subscriber so you don't miss a single video. If you want to contribute more directly, consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. The money comes back to you in the form of bigger and better videos. Until next time, keep us in your sights.